we're going to be talking about the North Bay Forest Improvement Program, which was actually one of the first programs that after the fire launched, um, back when it was called Rebuild North Bay. So um, when Jen recruited me to the After the Fire board, I was sort of the enviro person, or I called it the dirt, water, trees people. Um, and we started a, a, Rebuild North Bay started as a four county effort. So Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino, and Lake. And we created a community of uh, natural resource managers in those four counties to come together and talk about how we were responding to the fire crisis, um, what were the opportunities and constraints. Um, community Foundation Sonoma County had gotten a bunch of resources from different foundations to facilitate dialogues like this. And it really was a chance, I would say for me, it was the first time I really had to step out of my silo and talk to people like you folks that deal with insurance and housing and equity and workforce. Um, so we were doing a lot of convening and mapping, you know, what are the opportunities and constraints to meet this challenge? And in the natural resource realm, we kind of all agreed, I'm a scientist, I like to think that what I do is important, but it's not really that we don't have enough science, right? Or that we don't know what the technical solution is when it comes to particularly wild uh, forest resilience. Is that, and it's not that we don't think that forest resilience has an economic value, but the economic value it generates, how do you harness that and bring it back um, to fund the work? So how do you get that sustainable funding loop going? So absence a complete change in our economic system, um, we were like, if we want to get to some of these communities that Carly and I were speaking about too, where there really is an economic barrier to doing the, the hazard reduction work, how can we get incentives going? Um, and I will say with the four county group we had, it really was the resource conservation districts leading the way. And um, um, that was sort of the origin of this project. Now I'm realizing I haven't even introduced you guys. <laughs> because it is the last session of the day. So I'm going to hand it to both of you. You can introduce yourself for your sections. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Molly Curley O'Brien. I'm the Senior Community Resilience Planner at WRA, but I'm up here because I was at the time of the inception of the North Bay Forest Improvement Program, which is what we we're going to be talking to you all today. I was the first program manager, starting with all of these fine folks at the table. <laughs> and she's also grew up right here a couple I miles grew up down away the street. and I live a couple miles away and I'm the executive director of the Napa RCD and uh, I'm a biologist by training but I had to learn about forestry just as kind of probably most of us in this room which is kind of on the fly on the job and driven by big disasters in our neighborhood hey, Molly you, you can explain what the North Bay Forest Improvement program is that's Lucas's slide just tell us what to do Molly you're wearing the power jacket okay it's very simple so it's a financial and technical assistance program for non-industrial small-scale landowners uh, there is a state model in California through Cal Fire called CFIP California Forest Improvement Program and there is a, a USDA a federally funded version called EQIP these are essentially to work with uh, small scale uh, landowners to help them navigate this challenging world of, you know, what should I even do? How do I think about my property? Um, so you give them that planning uh, expertise and then you can pipe them into getting financial assistance. Sometimes they don't need that or want that. They want to move faster than maybe we can move through our program, although we're pretty quick. Uh, and then we do have a financial assistance program that's tied to us that will pay for a chunk of that planning work with a commercial forester or for the implementation work. So that's fuels management work uh, on the ground with all the variety of practices. And we utilize the USDA uh, BMPs, best management practices, which in California, the feds and the state kind of came together to create one model for forest management planning really based off of uh, USDA practices for uh, how to manage fuels. And I think what made this particularly so unique, given the fact that Lucas has already described two, two programs, both at the federal level and state level that are in existence, this is a regional level. Four counties that have very unique geographies, very unique communities and populations. And so how do you use public dollars, not just to 
be spent on private land, but these landowners that have these needs and that have this level of trust with their government and this level of trust with special districts like resource conservation districts. And so the idea was to reimagine how government programs could really look at a much closer to the community level. And, um, and given that so many of these RCDs we're already working together. It made only it made so much sense to continue that partnership, but I would also venture to say that it felt like a maybe a larger scale than any other before. Lucas, yeah. So uh, we we basically felt like it. it yeah. So it took a little while to get this going because we had to stand up a new program. So we did have to build this out, build out the infrastructure for dealing with applications. We have and, a slide on that. And we've been learning as we go. So I'll mention a couple of the whys, kind of from my perspective, why we got into this uh, when there was the state level program and this federal level program. First thing is CAL FIRE um, is struggling to do their work here, like the local unit, and then the local unit having to go and fight fires all over California and also fight fires in other states. So CAL FIRE was you know, really strained with resources and they didn't have many staff operating the program here locally. Uh, so we approached CAL FIRE from the very beginning, we applied for CAL FIRE funding for this and we worked with Stu McMorrow to kind of conceptualize this. Um, and we wanted to create a regional model that's basically, we can hand out to any region. We wanted to focus on our region because we were already collaborating here locally. We you know, know all the stakeholders, um, and so on. But it's really important to create a regionally grounded program because for a couple of reasons. One is we're here to actually show up and to listen to landowners and then to provide that technical assistance fairly promptly. Um, so with our model, we have four different organizations in each of the counties that's the lead in providing that technical assistance. And then we were able to create the financial incentives that were appropriate to our region. This is an expensive area. CAL FIRE was creating standardized incentive rates based on a state average, um, we were noticing that there was not a lot of uptake in some of these uh, um, uh, practices. Um, and then the feds, similarly, they do adjust occasionally uh, their rates, but um, they weren't really appropriate for our area, so we weren't incenting enough action. And so we really wanted to kind of create that model that would incent the action here locally. The other piece of the why is this is something that Carolyn just touched on in her presentation around the difference between forested lands that's, that is publicly owned and privately owned. You know, Sonoma County, the, where we all are right now, 90% of the forested lands in this county are privately owned. And so, you know, we need to really rethink about how we're allocating funds to make our wild land, our forested lands more resilient if 90% of those are not gonna be, you know, cut and dry public dollars to public land. And so there's, you know, there's more of the data up there of the percentages of public and privately owned um, by county that are participating in this program, but again, that reinforces this idea of what's what's happening at the state level is 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 just not cutting it, and so there needs to be more. There needs to be more at a local level to be able to execute. So then, how did we actually build it up? So Lucas talked about we needed to sort of steer, <laughs> invent the wheel and steer it at the same time. After we found out that we were awarded that preliminary 1.5 million dollars from Cal Fire. Um, back in July of 2020. So, you know, clocks clocks started in July 2020. We needed to have something rolling by February 2021. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. And so then I am not a scientist. I have an English degree. And I also have a master's in public policy and an MBA. But I also have triplet brothers that I think really paved the way for how I could be a cat herder and boss people around and really older sistered my way into getting this group of folks together to really make something unique come to life. I'm, I'm really trying to get you guys to engage with me since it's five o'clock. I'm, I'm hoping that it's working. <laughs> um, so what we did was a couple of things. So we had these guidelines. You know, These guidelines were our North Star to be able to make sure that we were in compliance and making sure that we're hitting these boxes. Objectively, the program was designed. We knew that we, we knew the criteria we needed to consider. We knew the eligibility that we needed to consider. But how that actually came to life and manifest in applications, in accounting, in landowner contracts, in steering committee, committee, committee meetings that happened 
like every other week and then monthly for a really, really long time. Those were things that were really necessary that I think at the beginning of all of this weren't entirely real realized, right? Like we didn't we didn't necessarily think about the magnitude of what type of organizing this was this type of project was going to require. And you know, something that Carol Leone also mentioned during her presentation is that that administration is 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 vital. It's critical. You know, we can you can administer a program or you can really move, keep it moving forward and actually have it allocate more and more funding as it grows. Um, so, you know, that was a lot of cat herding for a lot of it. It was a lot of, cha you know, eliciting change behavior, trying to get landowners to do something different that's never been done before. It was innovative system systems building. It was creating, like, back portals to be able to create an application that landowners can interface on a website that then if they submit an application, we have that information on the back end. You know, these are things that just required so much brain capacity of the, um, for so many different folks. Um, that nimble administration, like we said, you know, we were inventing this wheel that, you know, at a regional level had never really existed before and had to really quickly steer it at the same time too, which meant that you know, we had to change course a lot, decide that, you know, a redrafting of a contract needed to be done, needed to re-meet to talk about, you know, eligibility criteria or talk about a treatment that isn't really cutting it or, you know, whatever it looked like in the moment, there was a lot of regrouping, reassessing, reinventing, reimagining to get it to a place come February 2021 where we were, we were ready to go. And I think that the secret sauce with all of that was trust, yeah, trust for landowners, for us, for them to be able to trust the resource conservation district, but I think it was also trusting each other that we were doing something big and that we were all just, you know, rolling up our sleeves together to get it over the finish line. I would just add that too, as a, as a cheerleader for this project, being on the board, but that the way the RCDs worked together was really sort of a model democracy because there was not a lead agency. We were a fiscal sponsor, but we were not driving how it was going to work. We were not driving the um, allocation of funds between the regions or how that worked. And it really was co-created as a team with um, Molly's leadership and then also support of Rosa Brandt, who's here, who's one of the program assistants. That's my cheerleading comment. Wanted to add one more um we're off script here, so I'm just going to, to some point that I want to make, which harkens back to Marco and Belinda's conversation around workforce development. So the other benefit of these types of programs is that we can be a pathway for that to occur. So just within my organization, just Napa RCD, and again, there's four of us plus Rebuild working on this. We have piped through lots of staff. We've trained them on the job. We've got them mentored with registered professional foresters, with regulatory folks, you know, CEQA and so on. And then they're now working. We actually have one of them who's helping to put together a PBA, a prescribed burn association now in Napa County. So, you know, they kind of grow with you. And so these types of programs to regionalize and localize things is really a great pathway to do that workforce development. So impacts. I was doing the math on this. And is my math about right that it's about $1,800 per acre incentive that the landowners are getting? Okay, I didn't mean to give you sure. a math quiz at five o'clock, <laughs> but it seems like that's about what it worked out to. Here, I got my calculator. We can keep talking while I do it. Okay. Um, because I think it's amazing you, the number of projects you've done. It's also not a massive number of acres, but part of my storyline that goes with this is that we're also building a culture of stewardship that hasn't existed before. And all those conversations that the RCD staff are having with these multiple landowners is creating a pathway for this to be more mainstreamed. So I'm wondering what what you guys are feeling like when you look at these numbers and you see the number of projects. Um, how are you feeling about the impact? So one of the things I actually pulled a quote uh, for this talk from one of the landowners because that creating that culture of do it yourself we wanted to create a model where the landowner can do the work themselves or they can hire it out. And that was a really important distinction from us for us early on. We didn't want receipts, tracking, do it for whatever you can do it for. It has to be done well and we'll certify that it's done well and according to spec. And then you get the rebate. But so, so that allows the landowner to really pick whatever methodology they want to use. Um, and 
I'm going to just read this quote uh, from one of the landowners that we just work with. The last thing in the world you want to do is bring in a butcher when you're looking for a surgeon. So it's very, very helpful to have the kind of guideposts as you're walking into a big important area and you know absolutely nothing about it. So I think that's the value it, you know, we're touching little acres here and there. Um, but collectively we're really altering the behavior and then that loan landowners talking to their neighbor, their neighbor now wants to apply. And so over time, we're really kind of creating those bands of implementation, you know, along ridge lines or those really high, uh, you know, fire severity zones where we want to do treatments. I think that the impact is that it will scale right in the way that Lucas is talking about in that if one person does it, it'll inspire another community member to seek out the resources to be able to do it on their property as well. But then also for other RCDs to, to scale and adopt this type of model for other regions of California or another special district in another state to be, to be able to create cost share, cost incentive programs like this within their regions as well with this. I mean, I think that the reason why there's been so much money spent to design this thing, and this will continue to grow and, and, and serve this region. And the idea is that let's t take the work that we've done and, and take the framework and be able to bake it in your re region as well. Um, you don't have to invent the, the wheel. So we did that for you, and the idea is to, to take it and go for a spin. Well, and it's a great example that when our Ag and Open Space District want to start a, a similar program with the PG&E Award Funds, Molly and I signed up and we were like, we've already figured this out, you know, and we're able to hand them basically the whole model as well, maybe the Salesforce database, you know, how we were databasing these projects, how to do it, so they did not have to start over from scratch. And just to speak to Salesforce, I think that that becomes a, a roadblock in ideating what it would look like in your region to do something like that. Salesforce was a tool that Rebuild had already, and we used the tool that was in existence. It, had, it just happened to be Salesforce. It doesn't have to be a CRM like Salesforce. I would say even, you know, say what you want to say about Google Docs and Google Drive, but I think it's looked, it looks quite different than it did now than it did a couple of years ago, and it could be just as helpful and nimble to be able to get this type of thing off the ground, um, as opposed to you know allocating dollars that you may or may not have in your budget to a CRM that's sophisticated like Salesforce. That being said, I've also seen a lot of really uh, really cool platforms that get at this type of work in a different way that may serve you as well. So it, there's a lot of opportunity and options between a Google Doc or a you know a free source like Google Drive and something like Salesforce. So encourage encourage what those encourage thinking and uh, and ideating what that could look like for you as well. And to be clear that those databases are being used to like track the applications, track the processing of the applications, confirm track payment. the payments, be able to report back to the agency about the the number of transactions and payments. So. Yep. Another thing about being regional is if we don't like that platform we can get rid of it and we could do something new and we could do it super fast. So we have learned a lot when we got that first grant and since then we've got $5 million of investment from Cal Fire um, and we have changed how we do things. So how we process applications, how we do the ranking because we kind of learned along the way and now we're just in a different place than when we first started this in the very beginning. So yeah, we actually uh, favor disadvantaged. If somebody was in a disadvantaged community or severely disadvantaged community, they were favored in how the funding was allocated and they were given more technical assistance, so more handholding to uh, develop the project and then to seek implementation funding. So that was one big feature that we built in at the very beginning of this. And yes, it's true, we're four counties and we really are trying hard to split the money between the counties. You know, it's not always going to be perfect quarter, 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 but we're really, it's, it's a very, uh, you know, top of mind approach when we're uh, implementing this program to do that. And the other thing to your point, you know, Sonoma County has a lot of resources compared to our neighbors in Lake. And um, I think the other thing is that the RCCs really stepped up because Lake County really just had sort of a volunteer RCD, I would almost say, and bringing that technical assistance and capacity. We also had... I think two registered foresters in Sonoma when we started. I mean, the, the limitation on the number of foresters was huge too. And so the RCD foresters have been going into Mendocino and Lake also to assist. Um, so that, that's been really incredible. 
Yeah, that's certainly a challenge with this type of program is that, you know, in order for these pro projects to be deemed complete and verified as part of the prescribed scope that they needed to do, a registered professional forester needs to stamp their approval and um, foresters are hard to come by. And there were, like Lisa said, just a, just if I think that there were just two of the within the within the project scope that we were able to have to um, tap to travel to all of these different projects. Um, even if there was staff at these RCDs that were able to go out with with the, with them, they had to be there to be able to put their license no, license number on that contract to, to deem it. That was definitely a challenge. And then just to also speak to the readiness of Sonoma County, I remember you know looking at the first batch of applications when those came in soon after that February 2021 start, they were pretty much all Sonoma applications, and I think a handful from. Napa and none from Mendocino and none from Lake and I think that that was a really good indicator of the resources that these particular counties were utilizing in the starting off point of Napa, of North Bay Forest Improvement Program and what the what the partners needed to do in order to make that more equitable moving forward with the goal being that there is parity in these applications and project selections moving forward. Um, and that, you know, more funds and more support and more resources really needed to be allocated and time, you know, time being one of them to Lake and to Mendocino to make sure that they know that this project, that this program is available, that they are eligible for it and that they can, that there are people that can help get an application through and submitted to be considered for this type of program. Now, do you guys have more points? Because I'm saying we have two minutes left. Should you take a question or where are we with your, yeah. So questions? Yes, back there. I actually had a question about really the equity overlie. And I know that this is something that's like learned and a lot has kind of shifted since you guys started this. So it's more of a, what do you think or what could you do differently moving forward kind of question. So when we're looking at the equity standpoint of housing, a lot of that goes towards really looking at the census track. And as we all know, unfortunately, that super helpful census is not as actually helpful as we would like it to be. So a lot of our housing element plans have had to include things like having equity committees, equity working groups, overlays with basically literal community members to understand where the holes and gaps are. And I know that's very true of Sonoma County. Obviously, it's very true of most counties. So I'm curious in this context when people are applying for these funds, was that something that was accounted for? Is it something that can be accounted for? And also, how did you account for it? And then the other thing that I'm going to ask, and you're going to hate me, is I know these projects are super important, but most people will say like, oh, I look out here and nothing seems different, right? So how do you get buy-in when people are like, well, uh, that forest looks the same to me, right? And the same with the redundancy of like, can you have money moving forward? Sorry, I'm gonna put five more questions in. Totally kidding. I, I called that one. <laughs> okay, two questions, I'll, take, I'll tackle the first. Thanks, Kendall. Um, part of the proposal was, I, it kind of going back to what Lucas was talking about that, you know, identifying resources for the different counties, that's based on census data that's determined for disadvantaged and severely disadvantaged communities. So that's census determined information that was baked into the proposal and program from the beginning, and therefore we allocate more money for those cost incentive programs. I want to say that for, um, for a project that's located in a disadvantaged community, they, the cost incentive share is 80%. So 80% of the total project um, would be covered by this program as opposed to 60% of this program, or excuse me, of this project. Now, in the couple of years of this program and having it, that we have found that that's actually not enough. And so more money has been allocated for those particular disadvantaged communities to have funds for forest management plans. So acknowledging that a project, a dire project on a property that needs it is not in a place, for example, like it would be in another region with a forest management plan ready with treatments prescribed, ready to go, shovel ready, can get, can get this going tomorrow, get this going tomorrow. Because we're acknowledging that that's not true across the board, more money has been set aside for those disadvantaged communities to get them to that place to have it be shovel ready. 
I think um, an area of opportunity for us in terms of kind of equity and working with, um, you know, smaller scale landowners, landowners that don't have a lot of resources is to also help bundle things for them. So for instance, there's all these contractors and they charge whatever per acre to do their work and they're looking for big jobs. They're looking for the $150,000 job or whatever, and they move around the state to do it. And there are people coming from out of state to do it. Um, what we could do is work with local operators and kind of say, hey, we'll bundle. These are small, maybe per per property, but in some, they're gonna get you right back up to what your goal was for the season. Um, so that's one thing we can do. Um, I think we could also just listen more to the community. So the challenge with using these statistics, like the census data in rural areas, is that it, it does not tell you actually where the disadvantaged communities really are sometimes. So sometimes that area could be considered not disadvantaged, and yet there are quite a few low-income folks living in that area rurally. So, um, you know, we've had a little bit of challenge with that sometimes, but we're adaptive. And Kendall, just to speak really quickly to your second question, I, th I think that there's a couple of things that are just elusive and Carol Leon was speaking to them around acceptance versus adoption. And, you know, the North Bay Forest Improvement Program strikes me as a, being a little different. I think that there was more willingness from the get-go to get this work type of done, but, um, I think that the, it all comes down to education and being able to have someone show you what this really looks like to be done in implementation. And and I think that that's what's the really wonderful thing about having the resource conservation districts being the the implementer is that it is a it is a an entity that exists in the community that that landowner is a part of and that they can easily drive to the property, maybe not easily, but they can drive to the property and be there. Um, and that's that technical assistance and that education is a part of it, not to mention all of the other outreach and education staff that those resource conservation districts have that can help when needed to get this to get this information out there. And it's it's not perfect and there needs to be more. And and of course, we we acknowledge that. But I think that there is that that's why it's good that the resource conservation districts are doing it and we'll do more of it. Okay, I want to thank all of you so much, and Lisa, thank you so much, and really for all of the hard work, like, it now lives, um, we're still the fiscal um, agent, but it lives at Napa RCD, and Rosa is the program manager now, and Molly is now onto a fancier job, and so I just want to thank all of you for your really hard work. I'm not a science person, and, or I don't, and I don't love a spreadsheet, so um, for me, this was like, okay, great, scaled, perfect. Now make it make it live elsewhere in a place where it can be scaled and appreciated. So I just appreciate all of you and your contribution towards the success and, and the real impact on people's lives, whether or not people can visualize it from afar. So thank you.